Have you guys ever wondered why we pray? I mean, Scripture tells us that God knows what we need before we even ask. So why pray? What do we pray for? Are our prayers even effective? Does anyone else have these kind of questions? I know I, I have. Now, Jesus, he has a lot to say about prayer. In fact, tonight we're going to look at a passage in Scripture, just a small part, the start of one of the longest recorded prayers that Jesus has ever spoken. But before we do that, I want to share with you guys one of the biggest moments in my life. Now, for those of you who are regular here at MBM, you would have heard me uh, share this many times before, but I really just want to zone in on one specific aspect of this moment, the prayer that I made. So I was in year 12. Put your hand up if you're in year 12 right now. Awesome. You guys are doing one thing better than what I was at your age, coming to youth group. I was not at youth group. I was not at church. I didn't want to know about God. And after I graduated, I went away to schoolies with my mates, a uh, week of supposed fun and a bunch of drinking and all that sort of stuff. Except this week quickly turned into days of depression where I would sit and just wonder who I was, why I was the kind of person that I was. I mean, I was 18 years old and I'd never been on a single date. Now, for me, that was a big thing. I'm sure there are some of you guys here thinking about dating as well. <clears throat> that was me. I thought to myself, you know, I'm not ugly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Chris Hemsworth, but I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm ugly. So it wasn't my personality. <laughs> I was a shy guy. Was I too weird? Like, what was it that was wrong with me? Those are the sorts of questions that I was asking myself. You mix that with uh, a bunch of alcohol and it was no wonder that I became depressed in this week. And so I went to this Christian event. This guy got up on stage and he shared his testimony, much like I'm doing now, except his testimony was crazier than mine. I mean, this guy, he was a hardcore drug addict. And he shared his testimony and said that he had this experience, this confrontation with God. After which, he completely cut himself off from all the drugs. He quit cold turkey. Now, you guys have to understand something. The type of drugs this guy was on, with the length of time he was using them, there was absolutely no way that he had no withdrawals whatsoever. And that was his claim. He had no withdrawals. I thought, that's just ridiculous. That's insane. Physiologically, biologically, that's just, it can't happen. And then I started thinking to myself, you know what? If what he's saying is true, if God is real, then it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, God, he's supposed to be this all-powerful, all-knowing being. He can do whatever he wants. And then he said, we're going to pray. If you want to be included in this prayer, put your hand up. Me being confused, lost, depressed, I put my hand up. And that was the first time I genuinely prayed in my entire life. And from that point on, the course of my life was changed. I can look back on my Christian journey and I'll be the first to admit that it hasn't always been great. There have been times when I was living my own way in a life of sin. I would even possibly go far as to say that maybe I wasn't a Christian in some of those times. And if you would have seen me in those times, you would have said the same thing. <clears throat> Except all the while I look back, it keeps going back to this one moment, this one prayer that I made. Prayer is powerful, isn't it? Prayer is powerful. Do you believe that? Because Jesus did. Now we're going to pray now and then we're going to get stuck into this beautiful passage of Scripture. So why don't you join with me, close your eyes and we'll pray to our great God before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time spent together amongst friends, amongst family. We pray now that we would be attentive to your word, that you'd be moving in us, that your Holy Spirit would be convicting us, that we would see your greatness, that we would see your son, that we would fall in love with you all over again and that we would grow in our understanding of you. 
I pray that we would really understand the importance and power of prayer in our lives, all for your name and your glory. Amen. All right, we're reading from John chapter 17. We're just going to look at five verses tonight. So why don't you read with me? After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This is just the start of the longest recorded prayer spoken by our Lord Jesus. And where it's situated event-wise in history is really important. Because you see, right after this prayer, Jesus is betrayed, he is arrested, he is taken to the cross where he suffers unimaginable pain for us and where ultimately he would die for us. He is about to experience something he has never known, the anger and wrath of God. That is something that we need to understand right away. Because you see, God the Father and God the Son have always had a perfect relationship with each other. They've never been annoyed at one another, let alone angry. And this anger is not just some sort of disappointment from a father to a son. It is not just some sort of fit of rage. No, this is the righteous judgment, this holy wrath of God upon sin. That is the anger that Jesus faces for us. The Bible says that in this moment, the land went dark. That doesn't tell you how bad and deeply significant this event is. Then I don't know what will. In all the movies and all the TV shows that we watch and all the books that we read, darkness always signifies and represents evil. And in this moment of Jesus on the cross, all the land went dark. That is big. And amidst all of that, Jesus knowing what would happen just before he was arrested, what does he do? Does he run? No. He prays. Isn't that beautiful? Whatever it is you're going through in your life, you need to pray. Whether it's exams or assessments and you're feeling overloaded and stressed, stop. Pray. When you need to decide what job to take or what you need to go to, stop. Pray. When you're finding it really hard at school because of friends or at home with family, stop. Pray. When you feel like you're lost and there's no hope at all, stop and pray. The bigger it is, the more you just need to stop and pray. Ask God what his will is. Because sometimes he will get you around it. Other times he'll get you through it. You just have to read where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and you'll see he was sweating drops of blood. Now, this only happens when you are under extreme physical or emotional stress and anxiety. Jesus knew what would happen walking up to that cross. And he prayed to his father. I'm going to paraphrase here, but he basically asked God, his father, get me around it. God said no. So he said, okay. Get me through it. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus went through betrayal. Jesus went through arrest. He went through a trial, through a flogging. He went through the crucifixion, through the cross, into the tomb, and he went through death. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that I know what each and every one of you is going through because I don't. I can't read your mind and I don't know your heart. But you can't say that it is worse than what Jesus endured on that cross. And I know that if he can get Jesus through that, then he can get you through whatever it is that you're going through in your life. You just need to actually stop and pray. Ask if he can get you around it and ask if he can get you through it. 
Because if you're a Christian, you need to know God is your Father. Look at how Jesus starts this prayer in verse 1. He says, Father, the hour has come. That one word, Father, it's huge for us. And he could have started this prayer with holy, 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 righteous, perfect, creator of the universe. And he would have been just as true saying that. But no. He says one word, Father. And that one word shows the depth of our relationship with God. It's deeply personal. Did you know that? And some of us might have a hard time accepting this because our view of God is either a projection or rejection of our own view on our earthly dads. But there is good news. If you don't have a father, you've got one now. If you've got a bad father, you've got a good one now. This father will never harm you. This father will never leave you. This father will never abandon or forsake you. This father will love you perfectly as a father should. That is the father heart of God. And what do you do when you know who your dad is? You go and you talk to him and you, you ask him for things and you make requests of him, right? I mean, in fact, as a child, I'm sure you could probably ask your parents about this, but I'm pretty sure that you would have annoyed your dad with the amount of questions and requests that you were making. I've got video footage of me um, at home, not here. I wasn't going to show that. Um, I was a small child. It's quite embarrassing. Um, but it was Christmas. I had a bunch of presents. And I'd grab one, I'd look at my dad, and I'd say, open it, and he would. I'd get the other present, I'd look at my dad, I'd say, open it, and he would. Then I'd grab another present, and I'd go to him, and I'd look at him, and guess what I'd say? Open it, and he would. Because as a child, I knew that he would care for me, he would love me, he would do things for me. I was dependent on him, even with the most mundane and silly things, like opening a present. And when we pray, it expresses this dependence and trust in God. And all that we think about him, all that we feel about him, is expressed in that prayer. As Christians, we can know that he will answer our prayers. But it's going to be in one of three ways. Number one, he's going to say yes, he's going to say no, or he's going to say later. If he says no, then it's for your good. Romans 8 tells us that. If he says no, it is for your good because he always works for the good of those who love him. If he says later, then wait and be patient. Because in that moment, it's not for your good. He will always answer our prayers. Now, at school, I'll be honest, I wanted a girlfriend. I wanted to be in a relationship with someone who would deeply know me, who would see past the mask I can put up sometimes, who would understand me. And when I prayed to God for the first time, I received an answer that was twofold. I received a yes. God said, Paul, you will be in a relationship, but it's going to be with me. And that is for your eternal good. And then I received a later. Because I didn't know at that time, but being in a dating relationship right then would not have been good for me. In fact, a year or two later, I did enter into a dating relationship against God's wishes. But he allowed me to do that to show me that living my way in accordance with my own will is not going to end very well at all. That's exactly what happened. See, during this time in this relationship, it was actually really unhealthy for my Christian faith. It ended up, ended up being the darkest part of my Christian walk. It almost ruined me spiritually. But the amazing thing is about our God, He's faithful. And he always brings his children home back to him. That's what he did for me. I remember one night during this relationship, I just prayed. I prayed. I said, Father, please forgive me. 
for my actions. Father, please bring me back into your arms. Father, please lend me the strength I need to end this relationship and please mend my broken spirit. And he did that. It was a very long process. There were many bumps along that road too, but he was faithful and he brought me back. I'll be honest, I'll be forever marked by my actions and they still affect me now. But again, He's faithful. He brought me back and he's now blessed me with an amazing girlfriend who loves Jesus just as much as I do, if not more. So sometimes God will say yes, sometimes he will say no, and other times he's going to say later, not yet. But you still need to pray. You still need to ask. That's what being in a relationship means, to actually communicate with one another. It's not one way. It's two ways. God will speak to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit, but we actually need to speak to him too. And that happens through prayer. Here in this passage, we see Jesus talking to his father, requesting something. Have a look again at verse 1. What is it that he's asking? He says, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Jesus is asking to be glorified, which on its own might sound a bit cocky and arrogant, but do you detect... The purpose behind that. He wants to glorify his father. Notice he's actually called himself the son a couple of times as well. That's not him just saying God is his father, but this is actually him stating his title as the son of God. With that comes authority. Have a look at verse 2. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus has been given authority over all people. Jesus has been given authority over everything. He has authority over you. He has authority over me. He has authority over your school, our government, other countries. He has authority over your time. But most importantly, he has authority over what's going to happen to you when you die. Last week we heard Brandon give us the word from Ephesians and we learned if we're Christian, then we are alive in Christ. We're no longer spiritually dead, but we are alive in Christ. That means we share in his authority. As a Christian, you come with the authority of the resurrected, ruling, reigning King and Lord, Jesus Christ, who, before he ascended back into heaven to be with his Father, said, all authority has been given to me. As a Christian, you have the authority to say no to sin and temptation, to say yes to God, to stop and pray, inviting heaven down into your life and not pull hell up. When Satan accuses you, saying, you're hopeless, you will die, you will never change, you will keep giving in to that sin, it's not going to get better, in fact, it's going to get worse. You have the authority to say no. I am a child of God, I am alive in Christ, there is a place in heaven for me, I will not be separated from the love of God, I come with the authority of Jesus Christ and there is no condemnation for me. You have that authority, and you should exercise that. But do it humbly. Notice how Jesus says how he got this authority. He says, you, speaking to his father, you granted him authority. It's not ours, it's God's. It's like when the police show up and they start telling people what to do and they make arrests. They can do that because they have authority from the law and because the whole police department is going to be behind them. It's not their own individual authority. We need to remember that because I think we can fall into this trap, this mindset of thinking, I'm a Christian. I have the authority to tell you that you're wrong and I'm right. Did you write the Bible? No, God did. So stop. Remind yourself who God is. Remind yourself that you are his child. 
and exercise his authority humbly. Inviting heaven down into your life. Don't become prideful and pull hell up. That is the power of prayer. That will bring glory to God, not yourself. And what do I mean by invite heaven down? It sounds a bit controversial. And I've got to be really careful how I explain this. Heaven is a place, yes, but it is primarily a person. It's about the relationship. It's like I used to live in Borkham Hills, and then in year five I moved to Guildford. So is my home in Borkham Hills or is it in Guildford? Brandon is about to get married. He's going to be moving out of his parents' house. He's, where's his home going to be? And what if, what if summer moves somewhere else? See, the location doesn't matter. It's the relationship that does. For Brandon, his home is going to be wherever summer is. My home is wherever my family is. It's about the relationship. Now, I get that from Jesus' words in verse 3. Have a look. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you. That is the relationship part. The only true God. There is one God. The Bible is very clear about that. One God. That's it. There is one way to heaven, one way to forgiveness, one way to eternal life, and that is with a relationship with the one true God. Jesus says this is eternal life, that we know God. So your eternal life, it doesn't begin when you physically die and go to heaven. No, it actually begins when you meet with Jesus, when you have a relationship with Jesus and you reject that sin in your life. When you do that, when you meet with him for the first time and you receive his love and grace in your life, something crazy happens. You receive the Holy Spirit. Your body then becomes a temple for him to dwell and you invite heaven down into your life. You become a, alive in Christ and you start your eternal walk with God. That's exciting. I mean, if you aren't a Christian yet, this could be the night that you begin that journey and you meet Jesus for the first time. In fact, as a youth group, I just want to stop and I want to offer that chance. If you want to meet with Jesus, if you want to commit your life to Jesus, I want you to close your eyes now and I want you to pray. I want you to ask for forgiveness. I want you to receive his grace and I want you to ask God to start that journey with you. And we as a youth group are going to pray for you right now as well. So why don't you join with me as we pray for those who are doing that. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And we pray for those now that are committing their lives to you. We pray that you would be opening their hearts to receive uh, your grace and your love. We pray that you would be putting people around them to build them up in faith and that you would be helping them to live a life of obedience because we recognize that it's not just with our mouth that we confess you are Lord, but it's with our heart and we need to live in that life of obedience and thankfulness. And so we pray that you would be growing that in these youth right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in verse 4. Jesus says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus isn't just praying for things to happen, but he's actually doing them. And that's really important because I think we can get into this trap of just praying and praying and praying and we don't actually do anything about it. As much as God wants us to pray, he actually wants us to do his work too. That means you need to actually ask God what he wants and then do it. That is that life of obedience. You ask God what he wants and you do it. You ask God what he wants and you do it. You ask God what he wants and you do it. Now that may mean you need to actually say no to some things in order to say yes to other things. It may even mean you need to take a day off and rest if that's what God wants. Because we can glorify God in our work by doing what he wants. We can also bring glory to God in our rest by trusting that he's going to continue working even when we're not. I think as a youth group, we need to just stop and ask, God, what is it that you want me to say no to so I can say yes to the things you want me to do? Now, this is something that I've done quite recently, actually. I've been praying over months, 
and I came to the conclusion that God wants me to give up a certain part of my ministry so that I can focus on other parts, namely my relationship with him, but also my relationship with my year 11 boys. And that's what I've done. I've given up that other part of my ministry so I can focus on that. Now, I don't know what God wants you to do. That's for you to figure out yourself. I'm just outlining the principle. I need you to actually apply that into your life practically. So stop and pray and ask God what his will for you is, what he wants you to do, and then do it. You might have to give up a good thing, but it may not be God's thing for you at that time. And so it's okay to say no to that. Throughout these five verses, we've seen Jesus is praying for himself. So you need to actually be praying for yourself too. Last verse, verse 5. Jesus says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus and the Father have had a constant union with each other since before the creation of this world. Jesus is asking God to glorify him in the Father's presence, yet Jesus has never been without the Father's presence. We as Christians don't ever have to be either. Even when it feels like he is distant, he is right there. Believe me, I know. I'm, I've been in a bit of a dry season myself, if I'm being honest. I have felt distant from God. A few days ago, I had absolutely no motivation to do anything whatsoever. It can feel really hopeless. But you want to know something amazing? As a Christian, the Holy Spirit in you is the presence of God that will never leave you. And the presence of God is in you, so you will always be in the presence of God. So pray to Him. Thank Him for the Holy Spirit. Thank Him for Jesus. Thank Him for the life that He has given you. And ask Him what His will for your life is. One of my biggest prayers was asking God into my life. Since then, I've prayed for direction in my ministry and I've received it. I've asked for wisdom in relationships, and when I've listened, I've been blessed. I've prayed for words to speak and to preach, and he has given them to me too. I've prayed amidst a broken spirit and emotional anguish, and he has guided me with a tender and loving heart through all of that. But I still haven't prayed enough. I don't want to live a life where my prayers are just something I do before bed, I don't want to live a life where my prayers are only ever asking and never doing. I don't want my prayers to only happen when I need something. I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize I've never really communicated with God. That is not what I want. I want to be a warrior in prayer. I, know, I want to invite heaven down in my life and I want to do God's will, not my own. Do you want the same? Now, I'm going to invite the band up, and as they come, I want you to just spend a moment in prayer, asking God what his will for your life is, what you need to do. Just take that moment, close your eyes, ask God, what is it you want me to do? What is it you want me to say yes to? What is it you want me to say no to? Just take that moment and pray. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We know that he endured so much pain, that he endured your anger and wrath, but he did all of that willingly for us so that we could be in relationship with you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who now dwells inside us, continually guiding and transforming us to be more and more like that perfect son. We pray that you will continue to transform our lives, that we will be living a life of prayerfulness, that we'd be praying for ourselves, our own walk with you, that we'd be, we'd be praying for each other, we'd be praying for this youth group and your church. We will be praying for your kingdom to be built. In Jesus' name, amen.